to you. Okay, thank you very much, Grant. And I'll go ahead and get my screen pulled up here. Okay. <clears throat> And while you're doing that, I will uh, share with our participants uh, a little bit about you. Um, so Katie Bell is a local food systems small farms educator with University of Illinois Extension. She's based in Murfreesboro, Illinois, and she covers Franklin, Jackson, Perry, Randolph, and Williamson County. She develops and delivers research-based programs that address all issues related to the local food system, and she provides timely and relevant programming focused on agronomic and horticultural crop production, cover crops, pest management, soil and nutrient management, and food safety and security. But Katie also has a background of raising swine and showing swine for 4-H, which is why we have her here tonight. So with that, you can go ahead and take away, Katie. Thank you very much, Grant. And I am gonna go ahead and turn off my camera just to kind of save bandwidth and also to improve the recording. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with swine. And as Grant said, I have a background um, in small scale swine production. Uh, grew up on a kind of a mixed farm, but we also raise uh, purebred uh, Hampshire's, Yorkshire's, and uh, Duroc pigs, as well as some mixed breed pigs. And then I showed those in 4 H. And so if you have any questions kind of related to uh, purebred pigs or, or registries or anything like that, toward, and feel free to ask me those questions as well and I'll try to answer. Okay. So just um, kind of getting started here, I do, I like to put up the objectives just to kind of keep me on track, but uh, we're kind of gonna kind of, we're kind of gonna go through and just talk about things that you need to get started, whether that's knowledge or infrastructure. Then we're gonna move into talking about some basic swine care um, and then also animal uh, and breed selection. And then I'm very, very briefly gonna hit on considerations for marketing if you're considering selling uh, pigs or pork. So just some vocabulary here. So that way, uh, if I use these terms and you're not familiar with them, uh, we've got a good uh, foundation to start with. So a gilt is a female pig that has not given birth yet. So gilts are typically female pigs that are somewhere six months and younger. Uh, sows are female pigs that have had at least one litter. A boar is an uncastrated male pig. And then a barrow is a male pig that has been fixed or castrated. And then piglets refer to any new or, newborn or young pigs. And then farrowing is the process of giving birth to piglets, as well as usually the process about a month leading up to, to pregnant or leading up to birth for, for sows, um, there's kind of a process with farrowing. And then a litter refers to the group of piglets born at the same time from the same month. So just some basic information about pigs that kind of help us understand them and understand uh, as we go to feed them and things that is gonna be helpful and beneficial to us. Pigs have a monogastric digestive system, um, which is somewhat similar to ours. And they are also opportunistic omnivores. So while they mostly in our um, confinement raised hogs or modern kind of way of raising pigs on a large scale, they are typically eating corn and soybean diets, but they are naturally omnivores. So they will occasionally eat small rodents, um, pigs will eat almost anything. Um, but in, in our structured systems, they're typically only on a vegetable diet. Uh, pigs are extremely intelligent animals, which becomes important whenever we're talking about moving them or trying to keep them pinned in. So we want to take into account that they are pretty smart, and that can be both to our benefit and our downfall. Uh, they have very powerful neck and snout muscles, or a very powerful snout and neck muscles, which is important when we consider our fencing. They have been known to lift up the edges of gates, and they can do quite a bit with their with their nose. And um, they use that also for that ability to root and dig up uh, all different kinds of things in the ground. One interesting thing about pigs. Um, <clears throat> that kind of contradicts the old sayings of, you know, being being dirty or making a, a pig pen is that they actually are very tidy and they have a very dedicated bathroom area that they keep somewhat near 
their water source. Um, this is important because first of all, we want to make sure that when we're putting in a water source that we don't put it maybe right next to the gate because that's also kind of gonna be their more dedicated area to use the bathroom. Um, and then also with them being clean, cleaner animals, uh, we want to make sure that we're providing them with a clean area. You know, they don't like to be dirty. They prefer to be clean. So keeping them in nice bedded areas um, or on pasture or something is, is something that they prefer. And they also want um, clean water as well. So, you know, that's something that we want to think about. They may have wallows um, or mud, mud holes or mud puddles that they will wallow in to help uh, regulate their body temperature as well as to control insects but we wanna provide them with an additional clean water source because they need that as well. Uh, pigs do have sweat glands, but they are not functional. So they have a very difficult time regulating their body temperature, especially in the summertime. So we need to be providing them with uh, additional shade, uh, protection from the sun. That is where we will see them uh, wallow and try to get into uh, shallow water tanks or mud puddles to help cool themselves off because they don't have functional sweat glands to be able to regulate their body temperatures very easily. And then depending on the breed of animal, um, they can become easily stressed during moving or uh, transportation. And again, this kind of does depend on the breeding of the animal. Some breeds are much calmer than others. Um, and then it's important to keep in mind that no matter, no matter the pig, um, whether they're meant for pasture production or conventional production, they all root. That's a very natural habitat. That's what they're built for with those really strong uh, neck muscles. And they like to dig for uh, nuts and roots and just kind of generally tear the ground up. Um, some breeds root less, but they all root. Just this is just kind of an illustration to talk about the the stomach and um, intestine tract of pigs as compared to ruminants, and this is important to note because when we're talking about small scale production or at home production, uh, we might want to think about pasture pasturing them or allowing them to forage in the the woods, for example. But we do need to keep in mind that. First of all, pigs are omnivores, so they have a pretty high protein requirement. And also they do not have the specialized stomach that cows and um, goats do, the rumen system, to be able to break down large amounts of grasses and forage matter. So that's just something to keep in mind when we talk about feeding pigs and the diet that they require. So I'm just very briefly going to touch on this um, kind of labeling area for talking about pigs. Um, some important things to notice on, on pigs is going to be um, when I talk about their underline, that's their underbelly. Um, when we're talking about female pigs, we're looking at their underline and their mammary system, um, which is important for their mothering ability and how many piglets they can feed at a time. And we also want a balanced and tidy underline on male pigs as well, because this can pass, um, they can pass those traits onto their female offspring if we're talking about breeding stock. So the underline is kind of an important area to pay attention to. And then also the, the top line, which is this area up here, um, that's where the big loin muscle is at. That's where um, you know pork chops come from, pork loins. That's all this big back muscle here. And they have two of those um running down each side so they have a, a right loin and a, and a left loin that runs basically from just behind the shoulder to the point of the hip and when we're evaluating animals we want that to be kind of if we're looking at them from from like a rear perspective we want them to be kind of rounded over the back and not too flat because that has um can indicate uh things about their their muscular structure and then I would just say um, kind of a word that a lot of people are not familiar with if they don't um, have a whole lot of livestock experience is this hock, which is actually kind of like their ankle structure. Um, and so then that is just a joint um, and then their, their hooves or their feet. Um, 
sometimes they're also, uh, they have a dew claw. So these are just some, some pig anatomy uh, words here. When we talk about pig health, um, I have something in here about calculating average daily gain. This is gonna be especially important if you are trying to evaluate the performance of your animals. So let's say you raise a litter of piglets and you want to, you're trying to, to better your, your program and you wanna keep uh, track of the gain, the rate of gain that these animals are putting on and kind of make note of that and keep track of that litter. And that's just a kind of a good calculation to know. So that would be the present weight minus their previous weight from the last time you weighed them and then divided by the number in between weight. Um, average temperature for body temperature for pigs is around 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this can fluctuate a little bit. And I talked earlier about pigs um, having some difficulty regulating their body temperature. That's also important for the wintertime, especially if we're keeping these animals outside. We want to make sure that they're accurately bedded and that they have a shelter, um, but they, they do just fine outside in the wintertime, but they also need um, additional shelter and protection because they don't have a lot of body hair to insulate. Um, heart rate can range from 60 to 80 beats a minute, and then respiration is 30 to 40 breaths. Um, that's just important if we're looking at animals that we think might be ill or, or under stress. Um, if it's if their heart rate is extremely high um, or they appear to be uh, breathing heavily, that could indicate um, a lot of things, maybe heat stress or other stressors, uh, maybe an injury, something like that. Um, but just something to kind of keep in mind. And then we do want to kind of regularly evaluate our animals for diseases, parasites, lameness, injuries, uh, anything else that might be going on. If we need to administer, I want to I want to take a minute to talk about um, administering injections, and then I have another slide talking about reading uh, medication uh, labels. There are you know several reasons that we might need to give an injection to our to our pigs. Um, even in, in situations where we're trying to be very low, um, low medication, low interference, um, there may be an instance where an animal needs something like a shot of penicillin because they've injured themselves and we want to keep them healthy. Um, so some important things, both for um, safety of the animal and also food safety later on if we're planning on uh, butchering these animals. So just a couple of words to know, intramuscular or marked IM, you'll see this on labels or um, possibly if a vet is talking to you. Um, and the best place to do an intramuscular injection on a pig is in this little kind of triangle right here that's behind the ear. Um, it's usually just behind and below the ear, but in front of that big shoulder muscle. Um, that's gonna be some of the, more smooth muscle, it's gonna be about the easiest place to put an intramuscular injection. Um, and the reason that we don't ever want to inject into um, the ham or the loin would be that if we have um, a case where, well, it could, all, it could bruise the muscle for one thing. If we have a case where the animal moves and they break the needle off, um, we don't ever wanna put it there because those are gonna be major um, cuts that we eat. Whereas up here, usually um, before in front of the shoulder, that's not typically put into typical um, consumption. Um, and so it's going to be safer if we had an accident with a needle to be up here as opposed to further back here. Um, under the skin or what we would call subcutaneous or sub -Q, um, are going to be typically injections done that are just slipped under the skin. And especially on young animals, those are mostly going to be the ones that are going to be getting these sub-Q injections. Um, we can grab them like they're being shown here um, by the legs and then lift them up. And there's um, some nice loose flaps of skin where those injections can be just put under the skin. And um, uh, that's about the easiest way to do that. And again, that's generally going to be on younger, smaller animals that can be picked up easily. So I briefly want to mention 
looking at and reading medication labels. Uh, and I will also caution that any drug use, especially in animals that are going to be used for consumption, needs to be directed to you by your veterinarian. So I recommend that you consult a vet and um, that you follow all of the instructions on the on the medication bottle and that are given to you by the veterinarian. But I wanna point out just a few things to look at here. Um, there are approved uses. So just like herbicides or pesticides in plant production, there are specific labels and uses that these um, medications can be given to. So if we're talking about swine, we can see that this medication can be given to uh, swine that are uh, experiencing issues with pneumonia. There are dosage rates on here. There's the route of administration. So we can see that this needs to be injected into fleshy muscle um, and should not be injected into the hip or the, hip or the rump um, or um, subcutaneously. Um, because it could cause uh, tissue damage. So that's another reason that we don't want to inject into high value muscle areas because we could cause some kinds of tissue damage. Um, another thing that is extremely important to look at on these medication labels, especially for animals for slaughter, is withholding times. So this also is, can be used on cattle. So it says milk that has been taken from animals during treatment and for 48 hours or four milkings after the last treatment must not be used for food. And then also the use of this drug must be discontinued for 30 days before treated animals are slaughtered for food. So that means there is a 30 day withholding on any animals given this particular drug. And this is kind of another label example over here on the other side of the screen. Um, residue warnings, um, cattle, so animals must not be slaughtered with 28 days. And pigs, so this has a different one um, between the, the cows and the swine. So swine, it is five days after receiving a single injection dose. So those are some really important things to look at on medication labels. So why choose swine as opposed to another kind of um, large livestock? Um, they're typically faster maturing than other animals, other larger meat animals. Um, and they also have what we would call a fairly high dress percentage, which means that when we butcher the animals, we get um, somewhere between 50 and 60% of that animal's body weight in usable meat. So if the animal weighs 250 pounds, then 125 of that is usable meat at the end of it. And the rest is bones, skin, um, entrails, things like that. Um, whereas cattle and sheep have lower uh, dress weight percentages. Um, they have a very quick turnaround. So you can go from farrow, so birth to finish, somewhere between six and eight months, depending on how those animals are fed and handled. They have about um, 114 day gestation. So that calculates out to three months, three weeks, and three days that the mother is pregnant. They also have multiple births, anywhere from usually around four to average is probably 12. But I mean, they, I've seen, seen litters, you know, around 14, 15. Um, cattle, um, you know, it's 18 to 24 months before they are from birth to, to slaughter weight. Uh, there's a very long gestation period. And then um, lambs are much quicker, uh, five to seven months from, from birth to, to ready to eat, but um, they have a little bit longer uh, gestation length. And typically sheep and goats only have, you know, uh, multiples are typically around twins, maybe triplets. Um, and so we can see a much larger yield much quicker from swine. Uh, they are relatively low cost to get started with. Um, that's not no cost. And you do want to do um, a cost analysis if you plan on raising them and just kind of sit down and, and kind of rough estimate what your costs are going to be and decide if it's for you. Um, another thing is that in comparison to some of their livestock counterparts, they require a fairly small space 
uh, and pigs tend to be fairly inactive. Um, they will spend a lot of time uh, sleeping, eating, and not doing a whole lot of moving around uh, where cattle and sheep uh, tend to need a lot more space to graze, move around. Pigs can have somewhere around eight square feet per pig um, and be perfectly happy within that space. Uh, just some, some things that to look at. Uh, these are some pictures that I've kind of collected over the, the years. Uh, the two pictures on the left, top and bottom, are uh, the first one. They're from the same farm, just kind of a close up. These are pasture raised pigs. They're raised in a silver silvo pasture area, so a partly wooded pasture. And the farmer was grazing his cows through first and then coming through with the pigs, keeping them there for, I think, three or four days and then moving them to the next spot. And behind the pigs, he was putting down his cover crops. And so he was using the pigs as kind of a rough tillage and then coming in and putting cover crops down behind them. Uh, from these two particular pictures, he said the pigs had been there, I think, about two weeks and they had um, roughed that area up quite a bit, but they were holding them um, in place to, to, they were waiting to send them to slaughter and so they were holding them. But normally they would not keep them in the same area for so long. And um, as you can see, they're kept in by a single hot wire. Um, you do have to train the animals to accept that wire and you wanna kind of start really young. Um, and they said even with that, sometimes they would have one get out occasionally. Um, but for the most part, they were they were pretty good. They were also providing these animals with supplemental free choice feed. So they could root around, but then they also had feed as well. Um, in the top right, I just wanted to um, point out that uh, having like a concrete, an old concrete pad or part of a concrete pad can be a good place to keep swine. Um, because then they can't um, do quite as much damage in a single area. And then if it will play, I have kind of a funny little video. There's no sound, so um, you won't be hearing anything. But this is one of our 4-Hers and one of her show pigs. She is um, giving him a marshmallow. <laughs> um, but I, I show this this video here for just a, a couple reasons. One thing just to say that they are very, um, they can be really engaging and, and friendly um, animals. And then the other thing is just to say that this is just a really simple pen where they were keeping their show pigs. So they had a free choice feeder and then they had sawdust bedding that they changed out every so often. And then they had um, a watering system in there as well. So some things you wanna keep in mind and kind of take into consideration are, what are your goals? Why, why are you raising pigs? Um, are you looking to, to raise them for meat production, uh, which, which might be the most common reason? Uh, maybe uh, you have children that are 4-H aged um, and you're looking for a, a good show project. Um, maybe you're looking at selling them, uh, raising, maybe you wanna raise um, pigs up to that 35 pound range and then sell them to other people for feeder pigs. Maybe um, you want to start, um, there are a lot of rare breeds and unique breeds. And some people like to uh, really like to put a lot of work into preserving those breeds. And so they wanna work in breeding stock and improving breeding lines. That might be a reason that you're, you're looking at getting started. Um, so you wanna evaluate existing pens or structures that you might have. Pigs. Uh, don't need anything very fancy, but as I said before, they can be somewhat destructive. Um, so you want to make sure that if you have solid fences that they are anchored into the ground pretty well. Um, so we use the, the hog panels or, or cattle panels um, and then drove those into the ground um, or tied them to T-posts that were driven into the ground. Um, but they will test fences and gates and um, you know, it, even if you lock the gate nine times out of 10, the 10th time that you forget to lock the gate, the pig will get out. Um, and um, they really, for shelter and things, they need just a really simple three-sided shelter that provides them with shade and a windbreak 
And then if you do plan on keeping them all year round, you'll want to bed that really well with, with straw, something to help insulate them. Uh, pigs do like, if there are groups of them, they like to be in a group. Um, but if you're keeping, uh, you know, farrowing in, in the cooler months, in the early spring or something, um, you'll want to make sure that those animals are able to get warm enough because you may have instances of them piling together too much and, and have loss from, from mothers laying on piglets um, because the animals are trying to get warm. Uh, timing kind of going hand in hand with that talking about shelter. Uh, do you plan on keeping them seasonally or all year? Because we can go from um, start to finish in six to eight months, you may just want to buy pigs that are a few weeks old, you know, eight, six, probably eight weeks old, uh, do feeder pigs and, um, you know, keep them for the summer or have show pigs for the summer and then be done with them. So you don't have to worry about winter proofing um shelters and things so think about think about that and and the work that that you'll want to put in at certain times of year um and then also think about your proximity to your neighbors um even pigs that are well kept um and clean and well cared for they smell like pigs um you know they farm animals have a distinct smell um so you want to take into consideration any zoning and regulations that there might be uh, especially if you plan on keeping larger numbers of pigs um, that comes into play. And I want to briefly mention um, waste management. So manure is a big part of raising swine and it is your responsibility as um, a responsible uh, livestock owner and manager to know the rules. Um, and so this is just a quote from uh, Illinois pork producers that says, uh, the reality is that Illinois EPA livestock rules um, contain provisions that apply to all pig farms in Illinois, regardless of the size of the farm or whether they meet the CAFO definition or not. So there are parts of those rules that apply to all sizes of farms. So, and, and also note the requirements increase um, if the farms are defined as a large CFAO or a permitted CFAO. So what that means is that large scale swine production is gonna have more uh, regulations and rules and um, the majority of us keeping a few pigs on you know, a couple acres in the country are probably going to be exempt from any uh, regulations, but it is, there are still rules that, that owners of swine need to follow. And um, I would recommend um, the Pork Producers Association has um, resource guides that talk specifically and interpret the specific rules for swine for, uh, from the Illinois EPA. And um, so I would recommend, you know, if, if you're concerned about it, um, just brushing up and being aware. Um, typically it's not an issue, but it is something to keep in mind, especially if you're near uh, water sources or um, you plan on, on moving that manure off farm. So I, I've briefly mentioned talking about uh, feeding and that is a uh, you know a big cost that goes into to pig production. Um, it takes about 700 pounds of good quality feed to reach about 200 pounds of body weight. Um, another thing to keep in mind that as a pig matures, it will take more pounds of feed to achieve one pound of gain. Uh, this comes into play when we talk about breed selection. So breed can affect the rate of gain. Some of our heritage breeds and pasture breeds are slower growing, slower gaining, where some of our, what we call terminal breeds or market breeds can gain uh, weight and muscle really fast and mature very quickly. Activity level and space can also slow gain rates. So if we have pasture raised animals or large spaces, uh, the pigs will run and play and um, you know they, they can lose a little bit of gain uh, that probably isn't too big of a deal, but it's something to keep in mind. Young animals will need a higher protein ration. So we need to be paying attention to feeding an appropriate ration to our animals at the different stages of their life. And also pigs will do better with free access to, to feed. So pigs typically uh, are not gonna overeat. <clears throat> Some of our other types of livestock, we can see issues with overeating grain but pigs typically gain the best when they are fed a free choice 
uh, diet. Uh, water, as I've mentioned earlier, is really important to gain and quality of life. And so I just want to point out uh, these pictures here. The first one is a nipple water. Um, the animals can use their tongue and that will dispense water to them. That keeps the uh, situations like the one below from happening where the animals get in the water trough um, and they may be muddy and they will, um, sometimes they'll tip those water troughs over. And um, once they make that water tank, they're wallowed. They're not gonna drink from it. And so you would wanna clean that out and wash it really well and then give it to them. Um, but something like this nipple water system um, can can help um, limit the amount of water and spill waste that you're going to have. Um, there are also some other systems where the animals can um, have like a an automatic water where they can flip it open with their nose and then drink out of a little trough. Um, those are options too and to kind of look into. But usually the the nipple waters tend to be about the most um, economic option. Um, this is just a, uh, these are just a couple charts that talk about weight gain and um, percentage reactions. So when we start out with kind of what we would be calling our, our feeder pigs, so around that um, eight weeks of age or somewhere around 40 pounds, um, we want to be providing them with a much higher protein diet. Um, and you can see that, uh, as grain is fed to them per day. Um, so it takes about three pounds of grain to get, um, and uh, that's about how much they're eating. And then you can see that uh, the grain needed per one pound of gain. So about two pounds of feed will give us about one pound of, of weight gain or muscle gain. And then as they get older to get one pound of gain, we can see that when they're around that 125 pounds to 250 pounds, it's gonna take almost four pounds of feed to get one pound additional of gain. Um, and then we can see here that we're talking about uh, when animals are smaller, um, they need a higher protein diet. And then as they get older, uh, we can kind of back that off to around 15% protein. If you are feeding, one or two animals, or you, you have animals that are um, specific uh, on specific diets, maybe they're show animals or something like that. You could feed um, a bagged feed from from a from a feed store. Um, if you're feeding um, several animals, you may want to consider buying your feed somewhat in bulk um, and and talk to a local feed mill and get a ground feed from them. Um, one thing to keep in mind with if you're purchasing bulk feed, you don't necessarily want to purchase all 700 pounds of feed um, at one time because it can go bad. You could have um, water spoilage, uh, pest animals bothering it, things like that. So um, that feed management and storage is something that, that you want to want to also think about. Um, this is just a real quick um, picture of a feed label. This is for chicken feed, but it applies to, to any kind of reading a feed label. If you're purchasing a, a pre-mixed feed, um, you can, they should all have a label on them that have the guaranteed analysis of what's in them. Um, so this feed has a protein, a crude protein of 18%. You can see um, the full list of ingredients and then um, a recommended feeding direction. And then warnings about any additional um, issues that might occur with that feed. Now, one thing to pay attention to on this label and then also on pig feed labels is that they're probably going to have supplemental copper in them, which if you are keeping sheep, um, you wanna be very mindful of that and keep the feed separated and feeding areas separated because sheep are extremely sensitive to copper. So just um, an extra note for, for that. Um, so if um, you wanna get started with pigs, um, an easy way to do that is get started with a couple feeder pigs. They're already weaned. We don't have to worry about, um, you know, the whole process of, of breeding the animals or uh, farrowing, anything like that. We can get pigs that are somewhere between eight to 12 weeks old 
um, they're up, they're moving, and then um, we can feed them out and then um, decide to uh, take them to, to processing. Um, so some things to keep in mind, don't bet on the underdog, don't, don't pick the runt um, in this situation because uh, we wanna choose the animals. If we have our choice of, of animals that we're choosing from, we wanna choose the biggest animals in that litter or in that pen. Um, those are the ones that have figured out how to eat, how to gain weight. And we want them because we're gonna have to give them feed, you know, less feed. We're gonna have to feed them over a shorter time um, because they've already started gaining weight really fast. Um, if you can buy them local, um, and this is helpful for shipping. Um, you know, it, shipping can be stressful. It can cause them to lose weight or possibly get sick. Um, so if you can source them, you know, somewhat locally. Um, choose healthy animals always. We don't want to hinder ourselves the same way with choosing a small animal. We don't want to hinder ourselves by choosing something that we're going to have to put time and effort into making get better before it can start gaining weight. Um, make sure you have your space set before you get your pigs. Um, so that, that way uh, you have your, your space set up, you have water, you have food, uh, bedding, everything set so that you can put those animals in as quickly as you can and give them a chance to start decompressing and, and relaxing. Uh, feeder pigs will range in weight from anywhere from 40 to 60 pounds. Um, and really, you know, they can be ready for market, you know, as early as six months. The time frame is not as important as the body weight. So we want them, um, you know, around that 230 weight is probably what we want. Um, because once they start getting really big or we have to do what's called holding them. So let's say they're ready to go to market and then, um, we call the call our local processing plant and they're like, well, we've got, you know, you're gonna have to wait three weeks before we're ready for your animal. Um, but three weeks can be a long time for, for holding a, can be a long time for holding a pig. Um, and so in that case, we would be limiting their feed because all they're doing at that point is putting on extra body fat. And depending on the kind of processing that we're doing, that body fat's just gonna go to waste. Um, now, in some situations, it wouldn't, but um, so that's something to keep in mind. We're just giving them extra feed at that point. Um, I'm going to talk here about animal selection, and I want to mention this is especially important if you are buying purebred animals um, and they have papers, but this should be noted in their genetic history. Um, the HAL1843 gene is a stress gene that we have also called the stress gene is a gene that we have noted in swine um, to have some uh, adverse effects on the animals. This has mostly been bred out of purebred breeding stock and um, you're gonna see less of this in, in crossbred animals as well. But this was quite problematic because animals with a single copy of the gene or um, would often um, have leaner uh, meat and less back fat and sometimes the meat would be lower quality. And then animals that had two copies of this gene um, are what we call stress positive and they would become um, in, in stressful situations become overstimulated extremely easily and the animals would often um, tense up and sometimes they will squeal and be very stressed out. And sometimes they can get so stressed out that they will, um, they will die. And um, it, it was a, a very undesirable trait. And so a lot of people have taken strides to breed that out of them. So it's not as much of an issue as it was, but it still is something to pay attention to if you're reading over uh, papers. And then um, the napole gene um, is typically not something that's noticed until slaughter, but um, it would typically result in meat being of a lower quality, um, typically a lighter color, watery, less palatable. This is something that has also been pretty well bred out of the swine, but if you're buying livestock that is, is purebred and has papers, it's something to pay attention to because that should be noted on their papers. Um, 
And there are some others as well, but those are the two main ones that, that you should kind of look for if you're looking at purebred stock with, with papers. Um, animals should appear to be healthy, um, just from like a visual inspection, they should be bright eyed, um, moving around, not appear to be under any distress. Uh, when we're selecting pigs uh, across the board, we want them to be moving freely with no um, notable stiffness or limping. Um, and that's important because if we're choosing animals for breeding stock, we want them to be able to get up and move around and not have any issues. And then also for our um, market animals or our animals that we're planning on sending to slaughter, we want them to have uh, be fairly sound and have uh, you know good limbs and feet because they are going to have to get up and go get food and water. And we don't want them to be any more stressed out or they will that will negatively affect their muscle gain. Uh, we also want our animals to be alert and responsive to the environment and then no noticeable defects or oops well um, no noticeable defects or uh, wounds on them so just briefly evaluating animals uh, for breeding with uh, our females we want them to have um, i kind of talked about the, the mammary system we want them to be balanced on, on both sides because that's where they're going to be feeding their piglets um, if you know anything about their mothering instinct and, um, <clears throat> you know, their ability to care for their piglets, we want mothers that are responsive to, to piglets squealing and that they will get up and not lay on their piglets. And then if we do have access to any kind of, uh, registration papers or records, uh, you want to look at average litter sizes and birth weights, and then also the number of piglets born alive, and then also the weaning number. So for example, if you see that she had 10 live piglets, but when she uh, weaned her piglets, there were only five of them alive, you might wanna ask questions because maybe she's not a very good mother and she was laying on piglets or maybe the piglets were not very vigorous. Um, so some things to keep in mind if you're purchasing animals for the purposes of breeding and raising your own. Um, males, we want them to, uh, breeding males or boars, we want them to have good, um, skeletal and uh, reproductive systems as well. Um, so that that way they can, can do, um, have, uh, you know, we may be keeping them around for several seasons and we want them to be able to move freely and uh, do what we, need, what we need them to. And then if we are looking at their uh, registration papers or any kind of records on them, we might see that they themselves had good post weaning body weight. So they gained quickly. Um, and then if there are any records of their family lines, because these traits uh, will pass, often pass genetically. Um, so we want them to have good post weaning weight, short days to market, good back fat and carcass length. Um, and then if we're evaluating animals that we intend to, to slaughter, uh, we again want them to be structurally sound, fast gaining. And then if we are choosing animals, um, we want to choose males that are castrated because they will gain better. And then also boars, kind of like billy goats, have a very distinct smell, and that can off flavor the meat, especially as the animals get older. So for males, choose castrated males, and then females um, are, are fine um, as well for, for market production. Uh, we want them to be large framed, well muscled, um, you know, to look like. Um, animals that we're going to eat. So when we talk about breed selection, um, some one thing to note, especially if you're raising a few pigs, this might be of interest. Some of our heritage breeds are going to gain more back fat because of lard production. Whenever lard was a very important part of um, you know farm life and a product that we used a lot of, pigs uh, were bred specifically to have more back fat so we could have that rendered fat. Um, so if that is something um, that is an interest of interest to you, maybe look into to some of those breeds. What we call commercial pigs are typically crossbred. So those are the commercial pigs in like our large scale pig production uh, for meat. Those are going to be cross breeds of maternal breeds and meat breeds. So maternal breeds are going to be um, a lot of our white pigs. So Yorkshires, Chester Whites, Land Races. And then our meat breeds, also called our terminal breeds, are going to be things like Berkshires, Durox, and Hamps. And I will break that down here in just a second. 
Um, it's a good idea to choose a breed that fits your system. And then um, one thing to know is pasture breeds or heritage breeds are typically a little bit slower growing. Uh, they tend to be highly maternal, so they have a very high mothering instinct, and they tend to be much hardier and tougher than some of our other commercial breeds of pigs. <clears throat> so this is just kind of a, a, an outline. The only one I'm going to talk about here is um, this is a uh, Berkshire hog. And there are also some old, what they call old Berkshire that is bred into some of our newer um, pasture breeds of pigs. So this is a Duroc. Um, we used to raise these. These were one of my favorites when I was a kid. Um, and they are a terminal breed. So they're bred, bred um, meat production. Um, and they were a US developed breed um, that has been around for, for quite a while. And Hampshire is one of the most, you know, iconic pig breeds for this uh, kind of like having an Oreo kind of pattern and this white belt that should extend all the way around their body if we're raising them for, for purebred purposes. Um, a really common cross is a Hampshire and one of the white maternal breeds. And um, oftentimes these animals will have what we call blue spots or kind of bluish black spots on their bodies. And those are crossbreds that typically are very good um, meat production animals. Um, so these are our maternal breeds. And um, I have some slides that go more in depth into, into them as well. Uh, these tend to also be, um, have, they do muscle, but they tend to have more fat. And so that's kind of why we cross them with some of our terminal breeds. Uh, Chester whites um, are typically, um, you know, a white pig, typically with no dark markings. On them, they can have small dark markings, again, if we're talking about breed standards. Um, now, one thing to know on these white pigs, the best way to tell them apart is the ears. So Chester whites have a, what we call a medium-sized ear that does droop, but landrace pigs have these very prominent drooping ears. The other unique thing about them is they are highly maternal and they tend to have very large litters um, and they have um, pretty long bodies. Um, and they can have um, additional ribs um, because of, of how long they are. Um, <clears throat> and then in Yorkshire, they are also a white pig, but they have um, the erect ears, where the other two have some form of drooping ear, their ears stand up. So um, just to kind of talk about our some of the pasture breeds that have kind of um, risen to popularity, especially when we talk about kind of backyard pig production and, and small scale. Um, one of the kind of founders of this is the Kuni Kuni. Um, <clears throat> and where the other pigs we saw had much thinner hair coats, these pasture breeds or um, heritage breeds also have a lot more hair. And that is to help them regulate their body temperature in, in cold situations. Um, Tamworth, um, they're very active and they have these really powerful snouts. So sometimes they can be a little bit destructive, um, but they are very hardy. And then uh, one of my personal favorites are the red wattle. Um, they briefly rose to popularity for their um, lean, extremely lean carcasses, but um, sometimes there is some issue with uh, skinning them because they have such little fat that it can be difficult for them to be skinned at the, the processor. Um, but they tend to be typically very docile and they're unique for these little tassels or flaps of skin that are also called wattles. Um, Idaho pasture pig is kind of a composite breed that has kind of risen to popularity um, because they are kind of a combination of best of both worlds. And they can also come in, in a variety of different colors and, and they're really uh, starting to gain popularity for um, for pasture and small scale production. So when we think about um, our main costs of, of having, having pigs, and if we're thinking about doing this, uh, raising a few to sell, raising some just for ourselves, um, pigs are going to be, you know, obviously one of our biggest inputs. Um, if you're looking at raising purebred livestock, then that gets into um, a whole nother value aside from market value because we're buying bloodlines and genetics at that point. Uh, feed, even pastured animals um, or animals that are being supplemented with extra 
uh, table scraps, for example, are going to need supplemental feed. Um, infrastructure is going to be another cost. Uh, shelters can be very simple, but I recommend um, investing in, in good quality fence. Um, butchering is another cost that's going to come into play. Um, if you are planning on selling the meat, whether um, individually packaged or um, maybe selling a half of a pig or a whole pig to someone else, um, the processor that you choose becomes important. Um, so that's something to consider as well. And I did include in that box folder, there is um, a flyer from uh, our extension that talks about um, the different classes of processors. Um, and then you could also, if you're planning on mark, um, having meat for yourself, you could consider butchering the animals yourself. But I highly recommend that um, if you've never done it before, uh, I recommend finding someone who has done it and um, either having them help you or learn from them because that is a whole process in and of itself and um, something to, to just keep in mind. So I briefly wanna mention, um, just thinking about our infrastructure. So pens and lots um, are stationary paddocks. They would require a lot less space but we will need to regularly clean them. We're probably gonna be providing more grain or other forages to the animals. Um, animals are typically gonna be a little bit faster gaining because we're keeping them in a smaller space. Um, most pigs that we get are gonna be more comfortable and familiar with the system because it's probably the system they came from. This is a solid fence system. So again, those panels or fencing that's, that's gonna keep them in. Um, so it's typically easier to keep them contained. We do want to focus on having good ventilation. So if we are keeping them in a barn or something, making sure um, a barn or a garage that we're providing them ventilation and a fan. Uh, pasture, we're going to need more space because we're going to be rotating to rest our pastures. Um, the pigs can supplement some of their diet with forage or if we're in a wooded area, maybe nuts and acorns. Um, and the animals are going to move around more, so they might take longer to mature. Uh, we do probably going to have to take the time to train them to an electric fence system and make sure that we have a good, reliable fencing system. We also may need to provide them with mobile shelters for shade or protection from the weather. And at that point, we may be considering parasite control because the animals are going to have direct access to the soil. And this is just a really brief uh, recommended stocking rate for, for pastures. And this is a list of resources. All of these resources are also included in that box folder. Uh, questions? All righty, well, thank you, Katie. Um, so we're gonna go to questions. If you have any questions, put them in the chat box. At this time, I'm also gonna launch our demographic poll. Yet again, this is voluntary and completely anonymous. Uh, we just do this for all of our extension programming. So if you've got any questions for Katie, please just put them in the chat box. Um, so Katie, are you currently raising any of these uh, pigs that you mentioned tonight? I don't think, I'm trying to think if we have any at, um, so my parents have a farm um, up in the Effingham area. Um, and I think we, I, we don't have any right now. The last that we had were, were crossbred, um, market pigs. So they were a uh, mix between the the Hampshires that I was talking about and then one of the white breeds, um, probably either a York or a Chester. Um, and so those were the most common uh, that we had. We did used to raise um, piglets when we were showing a lot. We would raise purebred. Um, we raised land race pigs um, and they were, I can attest to the fact that they were very prolific and had large litters and they were really good mothers, um, sometimes to the point of being overprotective. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind too, is um, handle hand, being able to handle the mother. Um, because they, we did have some issues sometimes with them being aggressive. Um, that is somewhat breeding specific though. I know you're based in Southern Illinois. Are do you see more pasture pig production that direction or, or kind of what do you notice with some of the swine production your way? 
Well, I guess it's kind of because I'm I'm in this area, so I I do see it. Um, and then I also work with some regenerative grazers, but um, there are several farms that I can think of in in this area that do um, some form of of pasture or silvopasture pig production. Um, I mean, also in this area, we have some pretty large scale uh, swine production of like the standard confinement, um, like the the Mashaw farm is is down here, you know, and they have pretty large um, farms. Um, and so that's uh, that's a lot of the, the pig production down here. So there's there's both. Um, and when we raised ours, um, they were in like large lots. Um, and occasionally they were free range, but that was not intentional. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, ours was kind of a, a mix between being full scale, like a pasture and then being in a confinement system. Mm. Um, and so I we have a, a uh, sorry to interrupt. We do have a okay. question from Matt. Uh, his question is, is there any good markets for selling small group of feeder pigs? So I would say, um, depending on the area that you're in, um, if you're looking to, to market people, market them to folks that are buying like a few pigs to, to feed out, I'd recommend, you know, putting yourself out there, you know, whether it's like a Facebook marketplace or a, even like a Craigslist, something like that. There are lots of groups and things that you could sell to, to locals. Um, you, if you're looking to purchase animals, um, it's it's going to be the same kind of thing where you're kind of looking for those in your area that are doing the same things. Um, I will say that sale barns or um, like auction houses and things could potentially be an option for either selling them or purchasing them. Um, the only issue with that is that at that point, those animals have mixed with a lot of other animals. And if you're bringing them onto your farm and you maybe already have existing pigs, um, you're gonna wanna keep those groups separate at least for a while uh, because of, of you know disease and biosecurity and stuff like that. Sure. Okay. Any other questions for Katie tonight? Let's see, we've got one more. So this comes from Wes. So Wes's question is, with pasture pigs, what should be considered for extreme cold beyond the habitat you already mentioned, such as negative ambient temperatures, high wind, et cetera? What should we be kind of looking for? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, so I guess also keeping in mind that you're up in like the, you're up in the rock, you're far north, right? <laughs> we, we are, yes. <laughs> Um, so that is going to be, uh, you know, if you have animals that are fairly well adapted to, to the environment, um, you know, they're, they're probably going to, I would recommend just start, if you're starting out with animals, like having, um, ones that are naturally going to have rougher hair coats and thicker hair coats, they will kind of also start to grow a thicker hair coat. Um, but you know, you're you're gonna you're gonna want to select something that has kind of that natural hardiness already. Um, so choosing a breed for that. Then the other thing would be, um, especially if you're planning on like farrowing on pasture or outside, and it gets really cold um, really quickly, um, kind of like what we experienced around um, Christmas time. Uh, you know, extra heat lights, things like that are going to be important. Now with that. You know, if you're far away, that's going to be hot, far from electricity. That's going to be difficult. Um, so, you know, having having a heat lamp, um, straw bedding, clean straw bedding is really 